good evening, and a very Merry Christmas to you. Told After Supper, written by Jerome K. Jerome, narrated by Edward E. French. Introductory. It was Christmas Eve. I begin this way because it is the proper, orthodox, respectable way to begin. And I have been brought up in a proper, orthodox, respectable way and taught to always do the proper, orthodox, respectable thing. And the habit clings to me. Of course, as a mere matter of information, it is quite unnecessary to mention the date at all. The experienced reader knows it was Christmas Eve without my telling him. It always is Christmas Eve in a ghost story. Christmas Eve is the ghost's great gala night. On Christmas Eve they hold their annual fete. On Christmas Eve everybody in Ghostland who is anybody, or rather, speaking of ghosts, one should say, I suppose, that every nobody who is any nobody comes out to show himself or herself, to see and be seen, to promenade about and display their winding sheets and grave clothes to each other, to criticize one another's style and sneer at one another's complexion. Christmas Eve parade, as I expect they themselves term it, is a function doubtless eagerly prepared for and looked forward to throughout Ghostland, especially the swagger set, such as the murdered barons, the crime-stained countesses and the earls who came over with the conqueror and assassinated their relatives and died raving mad. Hollow moans and fiendish grins are, one may be sure, energetically practiced up. Blood-curdling shrieks and marrow-freezing gestures are probably rehearsed for weeks beforehand. Rusty chains and gory daggers are overhauled and put into good working order, and sheets and shrouds, laid carefully by from the previous year's show, are taken down and shaken out and mended and aired. Oh, it is a stirring night in Ghostland, the night of December the 24th. Ghosts never come out on Christmas night itself, you may have noticed. Christmas Eve, we suspect, has been too much for them. They're not used to excitement. For about a week after Christmas Eve, the gentlemen ghosts, no doubt, feel as if they are all head and go about making solemn resolutions to themselves that they will stop in next Christmas Eve, while lady specters are contradictory and snappish and liable to burst into tears and leave the room hurriedly on being spoken to for no perceptible cause whatever. Ghosts with no position to maintain, mere middle-class ghosts, occasionally, I believe, do a little haunting on off nights, on All Hallows' Eve and at Midsummer, and some will even run up for a mere local event, to celebrate, for instance, the anniversary of the hanging of somebody's grandfather, or to prophesy a misfortune. He does love prophesying a misfortune, does the average British ghost. Send him out to prognosticate trouble to somebody, and he is happy. Let him force his way into a peaceful home and turn the whole house upside down by foretelling a funeral or predicting a bankruptcy or hinting at a coming disgrace or some other terrible disaster about which nobody in their senses want to know sooner than they could possibly help and the prior knowledge of which can serve no useful purpose whatsoever and he feels he is combining duty with pleasure. He would never forgive himself if anybody in his family had a trouble and he had not been there for a couple of months beforehand, doing silly tricks on the lawn or balancing himself on somebody's bed rail. Then there are, besides the very young or very conscientious ghosts with a lost will or an undiscovered number weighing heavy on their minds, who will haunt steadily all the year round, and also the fussy ghost who is indignant at having been buried in the dustbin or in the village pond, and who never gives the parish a single night's quiet until somebody has paid for a first-class funeral for him. But these are the exceptions. As I have said, the average orthodox ghost does his one turn a year on Christmas Eve and is satisfied. Why on Christmas Eve, of all nights in the year, I never could myself understand. It is invariably one of the most dismal of nights to be out in, cold, muddy, and wet. And besides, at Christmas time, everybody has quite enough to put up with in the way of a house full of living relations, without wanting the ghosts of any dead ones mooning about the place, I'm sure. There must be something ghostly in the air of Christmas, something about the close, muggy atmosphere that draws up the ghosts, like the dampness of the summer rains brings out the frogs and snails, 
And not only do the ghosts themselves always walk on Christmas Eve, but live people always sit and talk about them on Christmas Eve. Whenever five or six English-speaking people meet round a fire on Christmas Eve, they start telling each other ghost stories. Nothing satisfies us on Christmas Eve but to hear each other tell authentic anecdotes about spectres. It is a genial, festive season, and we love to muse upon graves and dead bodies and murders and blood. There's a good deal of similarity about our ghostly experiences, but this, of course, is not our fault, but the fault of the ghosts, who will never try any new performances, but will always keep steadily to old, safe business. The consequence is that when you have been at one Christmas Eve party and heard six people relate their adventures with spirits, you do not require to hear any more ghost stories. <laughs> to listen to any further ghost stories after that would be like sitting out two farcical comedies or taking in two comic journals. The repetition would become wearisome. There's always the young man who was, one year, spending the Christmas at a country house, and, on Christmas Eve, they put him to sleep in the West Wing. Then, in the middle of the night, the room door quietly opens, and somebody, generally a lady in her nightdress, walks slowly in and comes and sits on the bed. The young man thinks it must be one of the visitors, or some relative of the family, though he does not remember having previously seen her, who, unable to go to sleep and feeling lonesome all by herself, has come into his room for a chat. He has no idea it is a ghost. He's so unsuspicious. She does not speak, however, and when he looks again, she is gone. The young man relates the circumstance at the breakfast table next morning and asks each of the ladies present if it was she who was his visitor, but they all assure him that it was not, and the host, who has grown deadly pale, begs him to say no more about the matter, which strikes the young man as a singularly strange request. After breakfast, the host takes the young man into a corner and explains to him that what he saw was the ghost of a lady who had been murdered in that very bed or who had murdered somebody else there, does not really matter which. You can be a ghost by murdering somebody else, or by being murdered yourself, whichever you prefer. The murdered ghost is perhaps the more popular, but on the other hand, you can frighten people better if you are the murdered one, because then you can show your wounds and do groans. Then there is the skeptical guest. It's always the guest who gets let in for this sort of thing, by the by. A ghost never thinks much of his own family. It is the guest he likes to haunt, who, after listening to the host's ghost story on Christmas Eve, laughs at it and says he does not believe there are such things as ghosts at all, and that he will sleep in the haunted chamber that very night, if they will let him. Everybody urges him not to be reckless, but he persists in his foolhardiness and goes up to the yellow chamber, or whatever color the haunted room may be, with a light heart and a candle, and wishes them all good night, and shuts the door. Next morning he has got snow-white hair. He does not tell anybody what he has seen. It is too awful. There is also the plucky guest, who sees a ghost and knows it is a ghost, and watches it as it comes into the room and disappears through the wainscot, after which, as the ghost does not seem to be coming back, and there is nothing consequently to be gained by stopping awake, he goes to sleep. He does not mention having seen the ghosts to anybody for fear of frightening them. Some people are so nervous about ghosts, but determines to wait for the next night and see if the apparition appears again. It does appear again, and this time he gets out of bed, dresses himself and does his hair, and follows it, and then discovers a secret passage leading from the bedroom down into the beer cellar passage which, no doubt, was not unfrequently made use of in the bad old days of yore. After him comes the young man who woke up with a strange sensation in the middle of the night and found his rich bachelor uncle standing by his bedside. The rich uncle smiled a weird sort of smile and vanished. The young man immediately got up and looked at his watch. It had stopped at half-past four, he having forgotten to wind it. He made inquiries the next day and found that, strangely enough, his rich uncle, whose only nephew he was, had married a widow with eleven children at exactly a quarter to twelve, only two days ago. 
The young man does not attempt to explain the circumstance. All he does is to vouch for the truth of his narrative. And to mention another case, there is the gentleman who is returning home late at night from a Freemason's dinner, and who, noticing a light issuing from a ruined abbey, creeps up and looks through the keyhole. He sees the ghost of a grey sister kissing the ghost of a brown monk, and is so inexpressibly shocked and frightened that he faints on the spot, and is discovered there the next morning, lying in a heap against the door, still speechless, and with his faithful latch-key clasped tightly in his hand. All these things happen on Christmas Eve. They are all told of on Christmas Eve. For ghost stories to be told on any other evening than the evening of the 24th of December would be impossible in English society, as at present regulated. Therefore, in introducing the sad but authentic ghost stories that follow hereafter, I feel it is unnecessary to inform the student of Anglo-Saxon literature that the date on which they were told and on which the incidents took place was Christmas Eve. Nevertheless, I do so. How the stories came to be told. It was Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve at my Uncle John's. Christmas Eve. There is too much Christmas Eve about this book. I can see that myself. It is beginning to get monotonous even to me. But I don't see how to avoid it now. At number 47, Laburnum Grove. Tooting. Christmas Eve in the dimly lighted... There was a gas strike on, front parlour, where the flickering firelight threw strange shadows on the highly coloured wallpaper, while without, in the wild street, the storm raged piteously, and the wind, like some unquiet spirit, flew moaning across the square, and passed wailing with a troubled cry round by the milk shop. We had had supper, and were sitting round, talking and smoking. We had had a very good supper, a very good supper indeed. Unpleasantness has occurred since in our family in connection with this party. Rumours have been put about in our family concerning the matter generally, but more particularly concerning my own share in it, and remarks have been passed which have not so much surprised me, because I know what our family are, but which have pained me very much. As for my Aunt Maria, I do not know when I shall care to see her again. I should have thought Aunt Maria might have known me better. But although injustice, gross injustice, as I shall explain later on, has been done to myself, that shall not deter me from doing justice to others, even to those who have made unfeeling insinuations. I will do justice to Aunt Maria's hot veal pasties and toasted lobsters, followed by her own special make of cheesecakes, warm, there is no sense to my thinking in cold cheesecakes. You lose half the flavour. And washed down by my Uncle John's own particular old ale, and acknowledged that they were most tasty, I did justice to them. Aunt Maria herself could not but admit that. After supper, Uncle brewed some whiskey punch. I did justice to that also. Uncle John himself said so. He said he was glad to notice that I liked it. Aunt went to bed soon after supper, leaving the local curate, old Mr. Scrubbles, Mr. Samuel Coombs, our member of the county council, Teddy Biffles, and myself to keep Uncle company. We agreed that it was too early to give in for some time yet, so Uncle brewed another bowl of punch. And I think we all did justice to that. At least I know I did. It is a passion with me, as the desire to do justice. We sat up for a long while, and... The doctor brewed some gin punch later on, for a change, though I could not taste much difference myself, but it was all good. We were all very happy. Everybody was so kind. Uncle John told us a very funny story in the course of the evening. Oh, it was a funny story. I forget what it was about now, but I, I know it amused me very much at the time. I do not think I ever laughed so much in my life. It is strange that I cannot recollect that story, too, because he told it us four times, and it was entirely our own fault that he did not tell it us a fifth. And after that, the doctor sang a very clever song, in the course of which he imitated all the different animals in a farmyard. He did mix them a bit. He brayed for the bantam cock and crowed for the pig. But we knew what he meant all right. 
I started relating a most interesting anecdote, but was somewhat surprised to observe, as I went on, that nobody was paying the slightest attention to me whatever. I thought this rather rude of them at first, until it dawned upon me that I was talking to myself all the time, instead of out aloud, so that, of course, they did not know that I was telling them a tale at all, and were probably puzzled to understand the meaning of my animated expression and eloquent gestures. It was a most curious mistake for anyone to make. I never knew such a thing to happen to me before. Later on, our curate did tricks with cards. He asked us if we had ever seen a game called the three-card trick. He said it was an artifice by means of which low, unscrupulous men, frequenters of race meetings and such like haunts, swindled foolish young fellows out of their money. He said it was a very simple trick to do. It all depended on the quickness of the hand. It was the quickness of the hand deceived the eye. He said he would show us the imposture so that we might be warned against it and not be taken in by it, and he fetched Uncle's pack of cards from the tea caddy and, selecting three cards from the pack, two plain cards and one picture card, sat down on the hearth rug and explained to us what he was going to do. He said, Now I shall take these three cards in my hand, so, and let you all see them. And then I shall quietly lay them down on the rug with the backs uppermost, and ask you to pick out the picture card, and you'll think you know which one it is. And he did. Old Mr. Coombs, who is also one of our church wardens, said it was the middle card. You fancy you saw it? said our curate, smiling. I don't fancy anything at all about it, replied Mr. Coombs. Tell you it's the middle card. I'll bet you half a dollar it's the middle card. There you are. That's just what I was explaining to you, said our curate, turning to the rest of us. That's the way these foolish young fellows that I was speaking of are lured on to lose their money. They make sure they know the card. They fancy they saw it. They don't grasp the idea that it is the quickness of the hand that has deceived their eye. He said he had known young men go off to a boat race or a cricket match with pounds in their pocket and come home early in the afternoon stone broke, having lost all their money at this demoralizing game. He said he should take Mr. Coombs' half-crown because it would teach Mr. Coombs a very useful lesson and probably be the means of saving Mr. Coombs' money in the future, and he should give the two and sixpence to the blanket fund. Don't you worry about that, retorted old Mr. Coombs. Don't you take the half-crown out of the blanket fund, that's all. And he put his money on the middle card, Sure enough, it really was the Queen. We were all very much surprised, especially the curate. He said it did sometimes happen that way, though, that a man did sometimes lay on the right card by accident. Our curate said it was, however, the most unfortunate thing a man could do for himself, if he only knew it, because when a man tried in one, it gave him a taste for the so-called sport, and it lured him on into risking again and again until he had to retire from the contest a broken and ruined man. Then he did the trick again. Mr. Coombs said it was the card next the coal scuttle this time and wanted to put five shillings on it. We laughed at him and tried to persuade him against it. He would listen to no advice, however, but insisted on plunging. Our curate said very well then. He had warned him, and that was all that he could do. If he, Mr. Coombs, was determined to make a fool of himself, he, Mr. Coombs, must do so. Our curate said he should take the five shillings, and that would put things right again with the blanket fund. Sure enough, it was the Queen again. After that, Uncle John had a florin on, and he won. And then we all played at it, and we all won. All except the curate, that is. He had a very bad quarter of an hour. I never knew a man have such hard luck at cards. He lost every time. We had some more punch after that, and Uncle made such a funny mistake in brewing it. He left out the whiskey. <laughs> oh, we did laugh at him, and we made him put in double quantity afterwards as a forfeit. Oh, we did have such fun that evening. And then, somehow or other, we must have got on to ghosts, because the next recollection I have is that we were telling ghost stories to each other. Teddy Biffle's Story Teddy Biffles told the first story. I will let him repeat it here in his own words. 
Do not ask me how it is that I recollect his own exact words, whether I took them down in shorthand at the time, or whether he had the story written out and handed me the manuscript afterwards for publication in this book, because I should not tell you if you did. It is a trade secret. Biffles called his story <coughs> Johnson and Emily, or The Faithful Ghost. Teddy Biffles' story. I was little more than a lad when I first met with Johnson. I was home for the Christmas holidays, and, it being Christmas Eve, I had been allowed to sit up very late. On opening the door of my little bedroom to go in, I found myself face to face with Johnson, who was coming out. It passed through me, and uttering a long, low wail of misery, disappeared out of the staircase window. I was startled for the moment. I was, I was only a schoolboy at the time, and had never seen a ghost before, and felt a little nervous about going to bed. But, on reflection, I remembered that it was only sinful people that spirits could do any harm to, and so tucked myself up and went to sleep. In the morning I told the pater what I had seen. "'Oh, yes, that was old Johnson,' he answered. "'Don't you be frightened of that. He lives here.' And then he told me the poor thing's history." It seemed that Johnson, when it was alive, had loved in early life the daughter of a former lessee of our house, a very beautiful girl, whose Christian name had been Emily. Father did not know her other name. Johnson was too poor to marry the girl, so he kissed her goodbye, bye told her he would soon be back, and went off to Australia to make his fortune. But Australia was not then what it became later on. Travellers through the bush were few and far between in those early days, and even when one was caught, the portable property found upon the body was often of hardly sufficiently negotiable value to pay the simple funeral expenses rendered necessary, so that it took Johnson nearly twenty years to make his fortune. The self-imposed task was accomplished at last, however, and then having successfully eluded the police and got clear of the colony, he returned to England, full of hope and joy, to claim his bride. He reached the house to find it silent and deserted. All that the neighbors could tell him was that soon after his own departure, the family had, on one foggy night, unostentatiously disappeared, and that nobody had ever seen or heard anything of them since, although the landlord and most of the local tradesmen had made searching inquiries. Poor Johnson, frenzied with grief, sought his lost love all over the world. But he never found her, and, after years of fruitless effort, he returned to end his lonely life in the very house where, in the happy bygone days, he and his beloved Emily had passed so many blissful hours. He had lived there quite alone, wandering about the empty rooms, weeping and calling to his Emily to come back to him, and when the poor old fellow died, his ghost still kept the business on. It was there, Pater said, when he took the house, and the agent had knocked ten pounds a year off the rent in consequence. After that I was continually meeting Johnson about the place at all times of the night, and so indeed were we all. We used to walk round it and stand aside to let it pass at first, but when we grew at home with it, and there seemed no necessity for so much ceremony, we used to walk straight through it. You could not say it was ever much in the way. It was a gentle, harmless old ghost, too, and we all felt very sorry for it and pitied it. The women folk, indeed, made quite a pet of it for a while. Its faithfulness touched them so. But as time went on, it grew to be a bit of a bore. You see, it was full of sadness. There was nothing cheerful or genial about it. You felt sorry for it, but it irritated you. It would sit on the stairs and cry for hours at a stretch, and whenever we woke up in the night, one was sure to hear it pottering about the passages and in and out of the different rooms, moaning and sighing, so that we could not get to sleep again very easily. And when we had a party on, it would come and sit outside the drawing-room and sob all the time. It did not do anybody any harm, exactly, but it, it cast a gloom over the whole affair. Oh, I'm getting sick of this old fool, said the pater one evening. The dad can be very blunt when he's put out, as you know, after Johnson had been more of a nuisance than usual and had spoiled a good game of whist by sitting up the chimney and groaning till nobody knew what were trumps or what suit had been led even. We shall have to get rid of him somehow or other. I wish I knew how to do it. Well, 
said the Mater. Depend upon it, you'll never see the last of him until he's found Emily's grave. That's what he is after. You find Emily's grave and put him on to that, and he'll stop there. That's the only thing to do. You mark my words. The idea seemed reasonable, but the difficulty in the way was that we none of us knew where Emily's grave was any more than the ghost of Johnson himself did. The governor suggested palming off some other Emily's grave upon the poor thing, but, as luck would have it, there did not seem to have been an Emily of any sort buried anywhere for miles round. I never came across a neighborhood so utterly destitute of dead Emily's. I thought for a bit, and then I hazarded a suggestion myself. Couldn't we fake up something for the old chap? I queried. He seems a simple-minded old sort. He might take it in. Anyhow, we could but try. By Jove, so we will, exclaimed my father, and the very next morning we had the workmen in, and fixed up a little mound at the bottom of the orchard with a tombstone over it, bearing the following inscription. Sacred to the memory of Emily. Her last words were, Tell Johnson I love him. That ought to fetch him, mused the dad as he surveyed the work when finished. I am sure I hope it does. It did. We lured him down there that very night, and, well, there it was. One of the most pathetic things I have ever seen, the way Johnson sprang upon that tombstone and wept. Dad and old Squibbins, the gardener, cried like children when they saw it. Johnson has never troubled us any more in the house since then. It spends every night now sobbing on the grave and seems quite happy. There still? Oh, yes. I'll take you fellows down and show you it next time you come to our place. 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. are its general hours, 10 to 2 on Saturdays. Interlude You've been listening to Told After Supper, written by Jerome K. Jerome, Edward E. French speaking.